Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, I can hear okay. you. Yeah, Great. slide seems to be working. Very well. Uh, so let's get started. So I guess this is the last talk of today. Uh, so this a talk delivered by Benyane Berg, uh, who, who, who will talk about parallelization of sequential quantum channel discrimination in a non asymptotic region. So, Benyane, please take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I'll be talking a bit about um, how one can compare parallel and adaptive strategies in um, quantum channel discrimination when one only has a finite number of channel uses and not in the asymptotic limit. And this is joint work with Lanjana Dutta and Robert Salzman from Cambridge and Mark Wilde from, um, from Cornell. So um, to start with, let me maybe introduce the task a bit. So what is quantum channel discrimination? The idea is the following. Somebody gives you a black box, which is a channel. So essentially like you can put in a state and you're gonna get out a quantum state. And he promises you that <clears throat> this black box acts as one of two channels so like it either works as a channel e or the channel f and i'm going to use kind of this notation with this bar in the middle to denote that and um the task is to find out which channel actually sits in the black box and um let's say you're kind of the process of finding out you're allowed to use this black box a finite number of times let's say n and if you want to do this kind of you have to figure out which input states you, input states you want to choose for this black box and um, in general, maybe, you know, since you can use the black box n times, the input states you choose could depend on the output states of previous black box users. And for some reason, I don't know how this works. Um, and um, it's not that hard to see then that kind of the most general thing you can do is something like this, where, okay, what do you do? Um, you start with an entangled input state on the left, where um, kind of half of it you put to your first channel use, and then based on what you get out and based on kind of what you have on the other half of your entangled input state. So usually we call this the memory or the reference system. Based on these two things, you're going to kind of apply some quantum operation which prepares the next input state and then also maybe changes your reference system or your memory a bit. And then you can keep doing this n times where you use the black box n times. And in the end, you will arrive at some, some state in both the output system of your black box and also what you have stored in your memory reference system. And then you're gonna do some kind of measurement to decide on um, what you think actually is in the black box. And um, so in general, the input states here were going to depend on um, previous channel outputs. And so this is why this is called an adaptive strategy. And also let me introduce the notation here. So I'm going to write rho i or sigma a for the state at this stage before I use the channel for the ith time. And I'm gonna call it rho i if my black box actually happens to be e. I'm gonna call it sigma i if my black box happens to be f. And okay, for the first time, because I haven't used my black box yet, they're going to be the same, but then later on, they're going to be different based on what's actually in my black box. Um, this is kind of a, a fairly complicated setup because I have these kind of essentially arbitrary preparation channels in between of issues. So um, you could say, okay, why don't I do something very, very simpler? Um, this is what is called a parallel strategy where um, essentially the, the input states don't depend on the previous channel outputs. So what you do, you, you pick some, some joint input state which has an input systems and then some reference and memory system. And um, kind of each of these n input system you feed into one copy of um, one copy of your channel, essentially kind of these are the end users of your black box. In the end, you're going to get some, some state again to which you apply measurement. And one thing one kind of can see fairly easily with this kind of setup is um, that if you do something like this, you can restrict the size of your memory system or your reference system to be um, as most as large as all the input system, whereas in this adaptive setup, it's actually not so clear whether there's really any bound on the size of this reference or on a memory system. In principle, it might be advantageous to make it arbitrarily large. And it's also not so hard to see that every of these parallel strategies I can write as an adaptive strategy. Basically, we're just kind of putting my joint input state in the memory system and then feeding out one copy with each of these preparation operations. Um, so this is kind of a way, way simpler setup. And now the question is a bit, okay, how good is this? Um, and people have been able to show in certain scenarios <clears throat> That actually asymptotically in some sense, which I'll describe in a second, these um, these parallel strategies are optimal. And so kind of um, this, this is kind of the general overarching question, to what degree are these parallel strategies good enough? So um, I haven't really stated yet in what sense I kind of want to, you know, what optimal means. 
So I have to, have to talk a bit about errors. Um, and for this, let me kind of very briefly talk about discriminating states, because you know, as I just tried to explain, at the end, when you do all these, when you use your um, channel n times, at the end, you'll arrive at some kind of state discrimination problem. So how do we discriminate states? So I mean, <clears throat> the way you essentially discriminate states, you do a binary POVM. This is the most general thing you can do, where um, measuring each of these two elements corresponds to you claiming that um, your state is either or sigma. So the first element, which I write as pi, um, <clears throat> is going to be associated to claiming that um, you have the first options, in this case, the state rho, and then you're going to make two types of errors. You can make the error that your state is sigma, even though your state is actually rho, and it's going to happen with this probability, and you can make the error that your state is the claim that your state is rho, even though it actually is sigma, it's going to happen with this probability. The second one we call the type 2 error, and the first we call the type 1 error. And uh, you can see that depending on what you choose as your your measurement operator, your PVM here, you can have some kind of trade-off between these errors. For example, if we choose it to be zero, then one of these is going to be zero, the other one's going to be one. So you can kind of decide a bit on which of these errors you want to minimize. And um, there's no kind of different settings which one can look at um, discrimination problems. And one of them would be to say, okay, I want to minimize like, the average error or the sum of these two errors. What we will be looking at instead is at the asymmetric setting where we say, okay, we want to minimize the type two error, so this thing, make it as small as we possibly can under the constraint that it have one error, which is this thing stays less than some threshold epsilon. And um, the minus log of this type two error is what is sometimes called the process testing relative entropy and written like this. Um, you can show that it satisfies data processing. So there's some kind of, some reason why you might want to choose this notation. And why do I look at the, the negative log here? Essentially what is also very often looked at is that the source setting where I have many copies of my state. So um, I want to just discriminate many copies of my state both from many copies of my state sigma. And then I want to look at kind of the decay rate of my error with the number of copies I used. And then this will just be one over n times this negative log. So it makes sense to look at the log in that sense. And um, okay, so we can come back to kind of our two ways of writing down you know, a setup for our channel discrimination task. And um, as I said previously, kind of if you use your channel n times, and at the end you will arrive at some kind of state. And um, the state will be different depending on whether your black box is E or F. So if your black box is E, here you're going to have E of rho, and then you know, your E only acts on this part of your state, and then on the, this bottom part you act with identity. So you'll have this state. And if your channel happens to be F, then you will have this state instead. So kind of at this stage, you can reduce this to this state discrimination problem, and then the Type two error rate per channel use such the type one error still stays below epsilon, so you have to be given by this quantity. And um, you compare this to the parallel strategy, where um, again I look at the, the two possible options I have at this stage here at the end after my channel uses, depending on whether my black box actually is ERF. And so I'll have to discriminate between these two possible options. So I have <clears throat> E tensor n acting on my joint input state mu or F tensor n on my joint input state mu. And from now on, I'm not going to write these entities on reference systems anymore. Um, I'm just going to kind of write things like this. So um, yeah, so, so the question is, how do these two quantities, which I just wrote down, so this one and this one, are related to each other? And people looked at this previously by looking at kind of the asymptotics if n goes to infinity. So what people have been able to show is that if I optimize over all possible sequential strategies, which essentially means I optimize over the first input state here, and then over all these preparation maps lambda, and look at the <clears throat> this type two error rate for the adapter for a sequential case, um, and then look at the limit n to infinity and the limit epsilon to zero, what this means is I look at the asymptotic weight such that my type one error also goes to zero, this what this putting this first limit here does. Then you can show this is equal to the um, what is called the amortized divergence. I'm not going to like write on the definition; it's not really important. Um, and um, this was done by by Wang and Wille. And <clears throat> then um, in this chain rule paper, Frank Fawzi went and Sutta were able to show this amortized divergence is actually equal to the regularized divergence, which is given <clears throat> by this limit, where I look at the the parallel exponent get optimized over all parallel strategies or so input states. And then again, the same type of limits. And this was maybe a somewhat surprising result because people have previously shown that in some different settings, for example, if um, 
you look at the symmetric case where I don't have this thing, I will minimize my type two error under the concern of the type one error, but I want to minimize the sum of the two. Um, actually, adaptive strategies in general, also asymptotically, will be better than power statistics. But okay, people have been able to show this. And kind of what we would like you to do is okay, I mean, this asymptotic result is nice, but we kind of want to know what happens at final end. So if I say, okay, um, I only want to limit myself to some final number of channel uses, what can I say? How much better can an adaptive strategy be? Or like, essentially the same thing. If I want to restrict myself to parallel strategies, how much worse is my, my weight going to be? And so in a similar direction, um, <clears throat> I mean, from this purely asymptotic statement, it could, could, could be that this first limit converges way, way faster than the second one. So just to achieve the same weight, you need a way, way, way bigger number of parallel channel users and sequential channel users, and whether you can say something about kind of the relation between these two. And so um, we were able to, to show something Providing this, and our theorem is the following. So let um, E and F be two channels such that this condition holds. Um, and I'm just going to ignore this for now. I'm going to come back to this condition in a second and say maybe why this is uh, like relevant and why it's maybe not very surprising. Um, and then given a, an adaptive strategy, so remember my notation was that these four I and sigma I were the states you have when you adapt the strategies after using the channel a certain number of times. So somebody gives me an adaptive strategy then I'm going to construct a parallel strategy from this, and I'm going to construct it like in a very, very general sense. So I'm going to construct a parallel strategy for every possible number of parallel channel uses. And also I allow you to essentially pick type one error threshold. So previously this were epsilons, now I call them alpha S and alpha P <clears throat> as you want. And I do this in such a way that um, my parallel weight, so this here is the, um, essentially type two error of my parallel strategy such that my type one error is less than alpha p and then taking the log in one over m. So the k rate per parallel channel uses is bigger than, so it kind of makes my, my parallel strategy is pretty good, is bigger than this thing, which except for this prefactor here, which is small if my type one error is small, which kind of we generally want to be in this, this setting. This is um, the type two error decay rate per channel use of my original adaptive strategy, and then I have an error term. Okay, what does this error term look like? Um, first of all, the error term is this logarithm with one over alpha p in it, which is generally to be expected because if I make my type one error threshold of my parallel strategy small, small, then kind of this also gets small, so there has to be some kind of trade-off. Um, but then I also have this n over square root of m, which to some degree tells me, um, okay, if I kind of make my m very large, so if I choose a parallel strategy with very, very many channel uses, this term is going to be small, but kind of M has to be at least a lot bigger, not just at least, it has to be a lot bigger than the original number of sequential or adaptive um, channel users I had. Um, this kind of, to some degree, gives at least a bound on the original question, okay, how much, how, how many more channel uses do I need in a parallel setting compared to an adaptive setting for, for them to be comparable? Um, and then there's this constant C, and this constant C still depends on E and F. And this is not the tightest bound you can give. We have some tighter bounds in the paper, but it's kind of one which is easy to write, up, write down. So you can write in terms of the um, the two pets when the entropy, or also in terms of the the max channel relative entropy. I'm going to define this in a second. Um, if you don't know what this is, um, so yeah, let me let me very briefly come come back to this condition here on the top. So if this condition doesn't hold. So if these two are equal infinity, then um, in some sense, E and F are perfectly distinguishable eventually if I have enough copies. In the sense that um, I can choose one of these two errors to be zero and the other one will, 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 will always <clears throat> also then go to zero eventually um, in the limit. And um, if you have, if you don't have this condition, you can show that there actually exists adaptive strategies which um, have an infinite exponent after a finite number of uses. But if you make your type one error small enough, um, so kind of for every M there exists a type one error which is small enough. So this thing cannot be infinite. So you cannot really have a relation like this. Um, but maybe also this case where this is equal to infinity is not so interesting um, because then, yeah, I mean, eventually you would always have <clears throat> to type two error equal to zero. Um, okay, so um, next I would like to briefly talk about how you actually prove this. So um, essentially kind of what you have to do is you somehow have to, you know, convert this entropic quantity where you have two channels with different input states to one where you have two channels with the same input state. And this is something which people call a chain rule. And um, what you can do is you can prove these chain rules fairly simply for um, the max and the smooth max relative entropy. 
So what is the, the max relative entropy? It's defined as the logarithm of the smallest real number such that your state rho is less than lambda times your state sigma, less than positive semi-definite order. And um, with this definition, you can fairly easily prove this chain rule for the smooth max, for, sorry, for the, just for the max relative entropy, which basically states that um, kind of this relative entropy between E of rho and F of sigma is um, upper bounded by the difference of the states in a sense, and then the <clears throat> difference of the channels when divided on the first algorithm. Um, and you can kind of prove something very similar for what is called the smooth max relative entropy, which, where you take this max relative entropy, but then you take the infimum of it of all states rho tilde, which are epsilon close to rho. And I mean, stress this here, what we, we do here is we take this epsilon ball in purified distance, but only over normalized states. People sometimes do this differently, but it makes the expression a lot nicer here. And with this definition, then you can prove, and I'm going to do this in a second, um, a chain rule for the smooth work relative entropy, where you get essentially the same structure, although your state mu here on the second term, it's not going to be rho, but something epsilon close to rho. And then here, the smoothing parameters add up. OK, so how do you prove this? Mm, essentially, what you do is you start with this definition of the smooth max relative entropy, which tells you there is a state mu, which is epsilon close to, um, to rho, such that this condition holds. Mm, and then, because f is a positive map, I can apply it on both sides. So I get this. And um, now I can do the same thing, but with this smooth max relative entropy, where I look at the difference between E of mu and F of mu. And again, I'm going to get a state tau, which is now epsilon prime close to E of mu, such that this condition holds. And now I can kind of insert this expression F for F of mu into here. And, um, and I'm going to get this expression, which is essentially already what I want, because now I kind of, I, I know that I have, a bound, I mean, this is just a number relating tau and f of sigma, and I want something which is a smooth max relative entropy of e of rho and f of sigma. So the last thing I just have to show is that this tau is also epsilon plus epsilon prime close to e of rho. And um, this I can do by essentially just using the triangle inequality and the data pressing inequality for the purified distance. So I express the purified distance between tau and e of rho as a sum of the purified distance between tau and e of mu plus the purified distance between e of mu and e of rho. And this first term, by the definition of um, tau, is less than or equal than epsilon prime, because there was an epsilon prime here in my smooth max of entropy. And then I can use data classing inequality for the purified distance here to get rid of the e's. And then again, by the definition of mu here, I get an, an e for this term. So I get this. So um, this is fairly simple. But now, what I actually want to show is a relation for the apostle testing relative entropy. So essentially, type two hours and not smooth max relative entropies. So some have to convert between these two. And um, there are relations so that you can do this. One of them is the following, which has been shown in this paper by uh, Anshu Berta, Jain, and Tumamichu, which basically tells you that the smooth max relative entropy, where you smooth with epsilon, is upper bounded by the by the hypothesis testing relative entropy with type one error one minus epsilon squared. And um, turns out we also need something else, which is this relation, which is kind of fairly well known because it shows up in converse bounds in um, Kind of all hypothesis testing tasks, a lot of papers where essentially relate the hypothesis testing relative entropy to relative entropy modulus some, some small error terms. And um, is anyone entirely obvious why I actually want to do this? Why I want to go to relative entropy? But it turns out we kind of have to. Um, yeah, I can maybe talk about this a bit later if there's some questions. And then for this relative entropy, we also want some <clears throat> some bounds relating this to the smooth max relative entropy, which I know as the asymptotic equidistant property. So what essentially states is that if I look at the smooth max relative entropy taking many copies of rho and sigma divided by one over n, this is essentially equal to the relative entropy of rho and sigma modulus some error terms, which decay with the square root of n. And um, this kind of first relation with a slightly different error term was known for quite some time, been shown in this, this paper from, from Marco Tomo Michel. Um, although this is the second one, I, I couldn't find anywhere, so we had to basically prove this ourselves. And in the process of doing this, we kind of found a slightly, slightly better um, Bond here, which, which uses these um, pet 20 entropies of essentially an arbitrary order. But this may be like a, a minor thing for <clears throat> people who care about these technicalities. Um, so kind of having all of this, I can actually kind of give you like somewhat of an outline of, of, of the proof of our theorem. So how do we start? Um, I start with um, 
this hypothesis testing entropy in the adaptive setting. So this is essentially, if you kind of forget about this one minus alpha S term here, the type two error decay per channel use um, in the for the adaptive strategy we start with. And I can use this bound, which relates this to relative entropy to kind of convert from this hypothesis relative entropy to relative entropy here. And um, the reason I'm doing this is now that um, I want to explore this, this structure of how our adaptive strategy looks like. That's what I'm doing here is I can write the, <clears throat> this relative entropy of the two states here as the difference between relative entropy of the two states here minus the relative entropy of the two states here, plus then the difference of the two states here minus the two states here and so on. But then here, I'm just applying a channel which kind of act the same way on, on this part and this part. So actually the difference here is going to be negative, so I can forget about it. And so I arrive at, um, at this expression. So I can write this as a sum of these differences. And then we don't actually have to do this next step, but it's very convenient. We can say, okay, I bound this one over n times the sum by the largest element, um, which I'll call, you know, the index of which I'll call L. And just have this expression. And um, now going from here to here, I can use these AEP bounds to arrive at a um, smooth max relative entropy where I now have m copies of my channel and m copies of my state. Um, and yeah, I need both directions here because one term comes with the plus and one term comes with the minus. Mm. And finally, now I can use this chain rule I proved for the smooth max relative entropy to um, kind of take this difference well, here, you know, you have channels with two different input states, and you have the two input states to determine why you have two channels with the same input state. And what is kind of conceptually crucial here is that um, because the state mu um, is not well tensor M, but just kind of epsilon close to it, we actually have some potentially tangled input state here. And we need this because you can show that kind of to, to achieve optimum rates and channel discrimination in general, you need entangled input states. And then finally, I can use this relation between smooth marks and hypothesizing relative entropy to go to um, this term, this is exactly what I wanted in my theorem. Um, so this is some kind of a brief overview of the proof. What kind of is the technically hard step, or maybe kind of also sometimes the interesting step is to show that these dot, dot, dots here actually give you the error terms, um, which I, I claim that you get. But yeah, that's something which we do in the paper. I don't think it's really something you can do in a talk. Um, so yeah, this proves the theorem, maybe like from a conceptual perspective, um, what actually, you know, how does my parallel strategy end up looking like? What really is my, my input state in the end? So one way you can think about it is that um, you can take your sequential or adaptive strategy and take it um, n time, I'm sorry, n times in parallel. And then, you know, you look at this one step where distinguishability and relative entropy increases the most, you know, the step L. And you look at the two possible options here for a state here. You know, you will have the state both the L tensor M here if your black box happens to be E, and the state sigma L tensor M if your black box happens to be F. And you can take the state and you can slightly modify it by making so sorry, you take the state both L tensor M and you slightly modify it by making it a bit more similar to sigma L tensor M. Um, and in this process, first of all, it's not going to be ID anymore. And kind of also the degree to which you make it similar to sigma L tensor M depends to what degree you want to accept a type one error. The argument goes a bit in the way that you say, because your sequential strategy is kind of good at at a kind of certifying E at this point when you have the state well tensor M, and you'll have a small type one error if you just keep well tensor M. And then if you, know, if you make it a bit more similar to sigma L tensor M, you're going to maybe increase the type one error. But so depending on what type one error you want to accept, you're going to move the state a bit further over to sigma L tensor M. And this is going to be the state that you choose in your parallel strategy and it can be proof you get the corresponding bound if you do this. Um, okay, how much time do I have left? Okay, I have one minute. So I'm going to skip over the example and just uh, go to the open questions immediately. So this kind of <clears throat> interesting open question still to be talked about here. So maybe kind of the most obvious one is, um, I showed you this bound that um, generally you need at least of the order of um, N squared parallel channel uses, if n is the number of adaptive um, channel uses you have, to kind of get a similar rate. And it's not at all clear whether this is optimal. Um, kind of intuitively, I would say it's not, but it's kind of not so easy to, to, to kind of show something better. Um, we tried a little bit, and you know what we think we would need to, to kind of get away with this, this n term in the numerator is some kind of convergence bound on the regularized relative entropy. So kind of knowing 
um, you know, in this limit where I take and copies of the channel, how many copies of the channel do I really need in this limit until I get close to the limit? And I don't think there's any result currently available there. And like, it's not so obvious how you prove that. But if you had this, you could probably kind of find a way to um, get, or at least kind of decrease these number of parallel channel uses you need per sequential channels. And you would probably get something similar if you had some kind of boundary convergence the amortized divergence. And maybe something also, which maybe some people who kind of know about this have asked themselves, okay, like, well, why doesn't he use second order expansions? Isn't this kind of way better than all the stuff he did? It kind of is, but um, if you want to, so the problem is that because you have entangled input states, in your parallel channel uses, the things you get are not ID. And um, if you want to use second order expansions, you need to have some kind of control over these variant terms when you have these non-ID states, either from the adaptive side or from the parallel side. And if you, if you kind of get some control over these, essentially show that these only grow with the number of channel uses linearly and not quadratically, um, then you actually get a lot further than what we did. And I'm pretty sure you would also be able to prove some converse and channel discrimination, which seems to be a pretty hard problem. People have thought about for the um, last couple of years. Um, so this is essentially why we, we kind of have to do something a little bit different um, and arrive at the bounds that we get. So yeah, that's, um, that concludes my talk and uh, I'd be very happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Andy. It's really inspiring talk. Yeah, we got a couple of questions. Uh, David, please just go ahead. Uh, uh, so thanks for taking the question. Um, I uh, I want to um, argue that the case when the adaptive strategy suddenly give you uh, a perfect strategy. Well, yeah. the um, parallel strategy never will get there. Already answered yeah. your first question. You mean the first open question? Yes. Um, we have an example from 30 yeah, I mean, I guess so. Yeah, it, users already got perfect, and you never get perfect with parallel strategy, right? But you dismiss that case with the uh, I guess that is true. Yeah, um, that you need in your theorem. I guess that is true. Um, um, yeah, okay, I'm happy to accept that. Um, I guess kind of the question is then if I if I put in the condition, what happens then? Um, but, uh, what, because what, kind I, of, what I want to argue is that you seem to yeah. have uh, dismissed a very interesting case when uh, the adaptive strategy strategy can can do something that the parallel strategy can never achieve. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I find this example extremely interesting, and like I don't want to. Um, like I don't want to in any way claim that you know this is, you know, not not relevant or something. But um, I mean, I guess kind of. You now, what what happens in this case, I guess, is that also the um, if you look at this asymmetric parallel exponent, it will also become infinity, and um, so I mean, in that sense. These strategies are still equal, even though okay, it takes kind of an infinite amount for the parallel strategy to get there. And um, I guess in that sense, we show okay, in this specific case, there is no kind of obvious relation between the number of parallel and sequential channel uses you need to kind of achieve some kind of equality because one is finite, one is infinite. Um, but then, okay, if I look at the case where it's not infinite, but like okay, I guess I'm just gonna work by way to say it, but I look at the case where kind of my condition holds. Um, at least right now, I can kind of, kind of show some kind of square root relation. And um, I would like to know whether it's tight, independent of, you know, this maybe just from a mathematical interest. Do you kind of get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Um, and yeah. related uh, question is that, do you have a way, do you have an algorithm or a procedure to find out whether there is a um, perfect strategy or not? Uh, you mean in the adaptive or parallel case? Yes, the, in the adaptive or case. Um, I think that there, I'm not that I've thought about this personally, but I think there have been some papers about this by. Uh, uh, yeah, not that I asked that question. I think maybe uh, Ren Yao and his collaborators uh, have a characterization. I just can't remember. I think they have, they certainly have other examples. Um, yeah, I mean, something which I think is kind of interesting and a little bit. I feel like so far the only like actual examples we have where we have perfect uh, distinguishability with adaptive strategies are when we have only two adaptive channel uses. And kind of what we would like, so for example, if you want to benchmark this, um, something we'd like to have would be something where, you know, this is, this is not two, but maybe like an arbitrary large number. 
and I'm not sure if you can easily construct examples like this. Like I thought about it for some time, and I couldn't uh, immediately. We wrote down some um, examples. We just uh, have no proof. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, that's what I'm interested um, in knowing if there's a way to. Uh, so I, I think there have been some that. papers, and I'm characterizing also the adaptive case um, when when you have a perfect discrimination. And I want to say it is exactly when this condition holds that these D max is infinity, but I'm not entirely certain anymore. Um, but there, there should be some. I, I can send them. I can find them and send them to you later. I can't remember the exact like authors or or right now. But, uh, It'd be nice to yeah, know actually, if there is yeah. a way to. Uh, I think that people. I think people have done something in this direction. Um, Thank you. Just from a from layman's perspective, are you talking about the case where you have two unitary channels? Yeah, I, I guess also there's been a lot of study in, in this regard. Um, I guess kind of a bit more interesting in the general case, yeah, maybe also, for example, the unitary cases. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Debbie, for the very helpful comment. Uh, I guess uh, Hayashi Sam has some. Question. Uh, so, so. Did, did you discuss the power, case of power channel? I, actually, this is not discussed. No, no? Sorry. I, I'm confused. So, Debbie and you discussed the case about the power channel? No? Sorry, I have a very hard time understanding you. Maybe if you talk a tiny bit slower, that will make it. Uh, so, sorry. Debbie and you discussed the uh, case of a party channel. Power, power, power channel. The case of party channel. No? Uh, no, no, we didn't really talk. Other. We didn't really talk about poly channels. No, we were thinking about um cases where um adaptively you can perfectly discriminate channels with a finite number of channel uses. That's what we were thinking ah, about. Ah, finite number, perfect. Okay, okay, okay. So mm -hmm. I have another comment. So you consider uh, second order expansion, but I think even in the classical case, this is open. Sorry, say the last part again. The, uh, classical uh, channel discrimination, still, uh, yeah. this kind of second order is open. So I tried this one, but uh, I could not. So, first, this I mean, essentially, what, what I'm saying here, second order is awful also for the quantum case. Like, I don't know how to do second order, that's so why I'm not doing it. Um, because yeah, essentially, kind of these these code input states kind of make make everything pretty like you have you have essentially no way to control these these um these error terms you get, and um this is why I even though of course I would like to use second order because the bounds you get are so much more tight, um I don't really know how to do it, and this is why I kind of have to do these these other things with these kind of more loose AEP bounds and things like this. Of course, in the case of a classical uh, strong combat is forward, but uh, uh, the second order is quite, still is quite difficult. Yeah, I, I can see that, yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Niranjana, maybe. Uh... Yeah, this is uh, more to the, in response to the comment you made, Yushang. Uh, oh. You asked about unitaries. Well, regarding unitaries, uh, uh, it was already proved by um, yeah. Anthony yes. Asin that they can be perfectly discriminated even in the parallel case of the finite number of users, I right? See. And, I see. I uh, see. Runi Duan et al. did uh, adaptive case. So just wanted to make that comment. So in that case, both are infinite. It's not really the, the thing that, so, so, so it's a different thing. That, Thank you. Uh, if there's a oh, baby. Uh, yeah, sorry, one more comment. Uh, uh, the, whether it, uh, the two channels can be distinguished uh, perfectly adaptively uh, was found out by uh, Wen Yadun, uh, Yun Feng, and Ming Sheng Ying. Uh, in okay. 2009, uh, there is a criterion there, but it would be nice yeah. to compare with your condition. And uh, I think it does not say how many uh, copies you yeah. need. If it does not specifically piece, yeah. say which how many copies, but it does say whether it is finite or infinite. But I think you can, not entirely sure, maybe this was the parallel case. Uh, no, maybe I'm missing many things. Maybe, maybe I thought there was a way sometimes you can get like a very, very crude bound, but maybe that's also I'm missing many things. Um, in the parallel case, you can use uh, STP bound. I think that's uh, how we, the one situation <laughs> that you cannot do that okay. perfectly. Um, I also thought in the adaptive case, you would have some some kind of weird, I don't know, actually maybe, 
I'm not, I'm not sure it, it's American. It's a different, yeah. let me mention that it's a different uh, STP that you can use in the adaptive case. Uh, that's result by Cherubella and collaborators mm -hmm. on the notion of these uh, quantum comms. Um, and in some other branch of uh, quantum information, they call it the, the quantum strategies. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much. We can discuss more offline. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, maybe just one last chance for Nila Jana. Then yeah, just, just a little comment. It... <laughs> no, no, I, I just wanted to this point out that. Really... Oh, okay. Yeah, last just time. one. Yeah, just one last comment to say that what is nice about Bianne's work is not to um, is to give, given the, the more general question that if you're given any sequential strategy, can you then come up with a parallel strategy which has the same error rates? Yeah, because the parallel strategy is, is easier to implement. So I think that, that itself is um, the appeal of the result. Thanks. Thanks for the comments. Yeah. Okay, I think we are slightly over time, but luckily we don't have any other shadow right after this so uh, so with this i would like to uh, take this chance to let's thank all the speakers of this session thank you very much for delivering these three very interesting talks and uh, to everybody else uh, hope you have a, a nice day slash evening okay 